Ishwaram's resplendent sun. It's the start of a bright new day. Time to rise, time to shine, Lord Divine. Time to lead us. Salutations to our beloved Lord, our dear Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai Baba. Brothers and sisters, once again it is a great pleasure to stand before you to share with you some of our experiences experiences that have been made possible by Bhagwan Baba. When last night Rick said to me, look Victor, we want you, or people are asking, the people want to know how you managed to transform these youngsters. Difficult boys, failures, how did you get them to become successful young men? After Lanka had been turned to ashes, you know what, you know the story? <coughs> With his tail on fire, he jumped from one house to the other until Lanka was burnt down to ashes. And how, after accomplishing his task, he flew into the air and all the Vanaras were seated on the other side of the sea, anxiously waiting for the arrival of the victor, Adman. They saw Hanuman in the sky, and they all shouted, Jay, Jay. And when Hanuman stepped down, they all surrounded him. And with great jubilation, they were so happy. Then Lord Rama called Hanuman, said, Hanuman, tell us how you defeated the armies of Ravana. How you destroyed Lanka. Tell us, how did you do it? Araman turned to Rama. He said, my dear Lord, how can I, a monkey, that knows only how to eat bananas, that jumps from one tree to the other, a monkey with a tail, how can I, how can I, be able to destroy a great city, such a mighty foe like Ravana and his army. It is you. And it is the same reply that I will give Rick and all of you that without the grace of Bhagwan Baba. It's not possible for myself, me, Genevieve, Ho, our Chinese friend, brother and devotee, who is with us and his wife, just the four of us, to transform human beings. It's Swami. 
So that, therefore, is the starting point. It is Swami who makes things happen. With His grace, everything is possible. It is important for us to bear this in mind, that we are not the doers. Devotees became afraid 
afraid that if they used the word meditation, they would be criticized because meditation has had a very bad image in the West especially. During the times of transcendental meditation, a few gurus have come to the West and have corrupted the word meditation. That is one reason. And people felt, oh, wow, our culture, our people would not like the word meditation. But we used meditation. We have not changed anything. It is meditation. As I shall show you very shortly, we find it in the Bible. This is just one example. Well, let's look at Psalm 1. In the book of Psalm 1 it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Such a person is like a tree by the streams of water that in its season. What we try to do really is to present Swami's ideals in their original form without fear of the consequences. You either accept or reject, it is up to you. We are not in Zambia to please the people of Zambia. We are in that country to do what Swami bids us do. The question we always ask ourselves is, will Swami like what we are doing? Will it please him? Not will the people like what we are doing. So this is just one example. Is there any teachings of Swami that you think any teaching is objectionable? Is there anything of Bhagwan Baba that you think is objectionable? Seriously? Pause for a moment. And the answer is there is nothing about Swami that one should be afraid of talking about or presenting to whichever public. Nothing. Either his life or his teachings. Let's look at his teachings. Just a random sample. You would remember many others. And ask yourself the question, would what Swami is saying be objectionable in the United States of America, for example? Baba says, there is God. <clears throat> And even our friend, the doctor, who says in his early days he was an atheist, Swami tries to convince even people who call themselves atheists, but in fact they are not atheists. What does it say? He gives example. You say, there is no God because you cannot perceive him, because your senses cannot reach him, you can't see him. But he gives examples like the sugar cane. There is sugar. Will you deny the fact, the truth, that there is sugar in the cane even though you cannot see it? Would you deny the fact that there is butter in the milk even though you cannot see the butter? But you have to take certain steps for you to realize the sugar cane, for you to realize the butter. So when dealing with children, these are some of the truths that we put across to them. And remember, they are intelligent beings. They judge for themselves using their own intelligence whether Satya Sai Baba, what he says is right or is wrong. In other words, we present Swami's teachings to them truthfully. Truthfully, this is important. Swami says the body is the temple of God, so we should look after it. He tells us this. Would such a teaching be objectionable to any society in the world? He says it is the temple of God. 
In the, it is the vehicle, even if you deny the existence of God, you cannot deny the necessity of looking after this body, of not putting into it something that is dangerous, something that would undermine it, its efficient performance, such as drugs, such as alcoholic drinks, or any other activity that is injurious to the body. Anybody, any sensible person would accept this as valid. He would. <laughs> well, he says, Swami says, be good, see good, and do good. These are the things we tell the boys. Be good. The world wants good people. Everywhere we look for good people. In the field of politics, in Zambia, during the last election, what was the cry? We are looking for good candidates, good politicians, not clever politicians. In other words, one has to relate Swami's teaching, Swami's life, to the conditions of the people. Swami says, start the day with love. Is this a bad thing to tell children or to tell adults or to tell the nation or to tell President Clinton that Americans should start the day with love, to fill every moment of it with love and to end it with love? Even if you deny that this is the way to God, you would accept the fact that this is the way to stability, political and social stability, and therefore prosperity. And we tell the children these, and we let them recite, and they see the truth in statements such as this. Now, love all several, Swami says. We should love all several. Sir, why should we love all and serve all? We say because we are all one. You are 73 tribes in Zambia. But can any one tribe live without the other? Is there not a measure of interdependence? Do you not eat the same food in the country? Are you not governed by the same government, by the same laws? If one part of the country is weak or is in trouble or there is chaos, will this not affect everybody? Are we not all children of the same God? We say we have come from the same seed. We say to them, it is like a womb. Everything has come from the divine womb. Everybody, animals, everything has come from God's womb. The little children will understand that bit. Is this a bad thing to say to any children in any part of the world? Swami says, start early, drive slowly, and reach safely. These are some of the teachings of Bhagavan Baba. Is this objectionable? What I am trying to do this afternoon is to show that our fears are unfounded. There is no foundation whatsoever, no reason whatsoever why we should be afraid to put across Swami's teachings because they are genuine, they are beneficial, they are meant to help humanity. Less luggage, if you have less luggage, you have more comfort. Swami says, put a ceiling on your desires. This is a spiritual principle, but it is also an economic principle. Because human wants and desires are insatiable. They can never be satisfied. We tend to want and want and want. And you cannot go on wanting and be happy because one's income is always limited. Limited resources, limited incomes, unlimited wants. This creates the economic problem. And this is written in all economic text textbooks, elementary textbooks throughout the world. 
You see, there is a problem there. There is an economic problem because of the unlimited human wants. Now Swami says, put a limit. Control these wants. Then it is possible for the equation to be balanced. Education, Swami says, is the study and understanding of God and his creation. And he says, Father, the end of education is character. But let's take the first one. Education is the study of God, the understanding of God and his creation, the application of the principles, the rules, and regulations that govern this universe. And in the process, for this to be possible, the development of human character is essential. But this is true. Why should we hesitate to say that education is about God and his creation? Well, you might say, but what has sending spaceships to Mars got to do with God? What has physics got to do? Chemistry, biology, and all the sciences, well, what have they got to do with God? What has computer science got to do? What has languages got to do with God? Geography, history, etc. But what is it really we are studying? What is it that we are researching on? What, are, what is the research about? Is it not about this physical universe, the universe that we see around us? And what is in it? That's what it is. That's what all the academic subjects taught in the greatest universities of the world. These subjects have to do with what has been created by God, the mysteries surrounding this universe, this creation. And so when you get your PhD in physics, that PhD is about God's creation, the laws of physics, the laws of chemistry, of biology, etc. This may be objectionable first. Some, some people might retort and say, this is not true. But it's up to them. That is their business. You are saying as a devotee, and we say to the children and to the education authorities, this is the revolution in Zambia today. Because whereas previously, education for them is concerned with the development of the intellect of children the intellects, also their physical, the physical aspect of their personalities. And we say, no, that is not enough. Because these children are not what we see. They are not bodies. They are gods. Well, when we say this, of course, they say, where is your proof? We say, we go to the Bible. Because in the Bible, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is within you. Don't look outside. Don't look here. Don't look there. It is within you. God is within you. Let's look at our code of conduct within the organization. What is wrong with the code of conduct? What is objectionable to it? It talks about meditation. I've already shown you just a bit of it in the Bible, but it's all through the Bible, in both the Old as well as New Testament, there is meditation. Meditation is encouraged, and it was practiced, and is still being practiced in Christianity. The, the monasteries, the great monasteries, of the world. There they practice meditation. Meditation in Christianity is now left with the, with the monks, with the priesthood. It has been removed from the populace, from the general public, but it is still there. We say meditation, meditate every day. What's wrong with that? We tell the children meditate every day and we say to them also, don't speak ill of other people especially in their absence. Uh, that is acceptable. Nobody wants to be spoken ill of in his or her absence. 
We say, let families get together at least once a week and sing the glory of God in their homes. And that used to be the practice in the early days of Christianity, before the building of buildings called churches. People used to pray in their homes. And they used to go around, just as we do today with bhajans, for example. We go from one devotee's house to the other. That used to be the practice. And that practice has been resurrected in the Satisa Organization's Code of Conduct. So sing bhajans in your homes. What is wrong with that? Put a ceiling on your desires. Set aside something. Do savor. Help people. Take part in the activities of the Satisai organization. So you look at the code of conduct, there is nothing objectionable. And this is what we say to the children. This is what we say to the teachers. We put it before them. We open our book for them to read about us. The Ten Principles, wonderful. Wonderful teachings there. Love your motherland, that's, the, that's number one, isn't it? Be a good citizen, be an exemplary citizen, but also love the motherlands of other people. I'm sure the, the House of Representatives and Congress would be happy to hear that Baba is telling all Americans to love America and make America a greater nation even then, you see. So there's nothing wrong when one looks at what we are doing. And we put all these facts before the children, especially the high school ones, for them to look at us. And we also open our book to the education authorities for them to know who we are. No fear at all. And we are not ashamed of it. Swami says, I have come to water the roots of all religion. We tell them this. And they love this. The people, the, both the students and the general public, love this. We tell them, this is what Baba says. He has not come to take over your churches, your temples. He has not come to drain your followers, to take them away from you. He has come to enrich, to fertilize each religion, each church, to make each religion stronger, each church better, to make Christians better Christians, to make Muslims better Muslims. This is what, what a beautiful message to put across to the nation, wherever one is, that this is what Baba says, and this is what we who follow him stand for, because we are interested in the unity of humankind. It is also a fundamental human right, isn't it, of the United Nations. It is also enshrined in the American Constitution. What Swami is saying, it's also there, freedom of worship, freedom of association, etc. So we say, don't worry. And therefore, we make no attempt whatsoever at converting anyone. We say, stay where you are. Stay where we are. And we check. We ask the boys Monday, every Monday, did you go to church? And we try to contact their pastors, their church leaders, to make sure that the boys actually attend their churches. So when one does all these things, there is no fear in them. They come forward. They see you as a friend. They see you not as a threat to their well-being. Let all the different faiths coexist, Swami says. Let them sing the glory of God. Let them not extinguish the flame of unity. Let them coexist. The doctrine of peaceful coexistence is a spiritual doctrine. It is also a political doctrine. Uh, America is made up of a multiplicity of people, people from different backgrounds. Is this not a wonderful thing for them to be told by Satya Sai Baba? To coexist peacefully? To live together as brothers and sisters? 
as Americans belonging to one nation? Zambia, we say to them, has 73 tribes. Look, boys, see what is happening in Rwanda. See what is happening in Burundi. See what is happening in Sierra Leone. See what is happening in Liberia. See what is happening in Nigeria. People fighting, people killing. Is what Baba, what Baba is saying, is it wrong? They say, no, sir, it's important that we live together peacefully. Now, all these are democratic principles. He tells us to obey the laws of the land where we are. That is the last principle of the 10. Now, let's look at the human values program, which Swami is talking about. Again, we say to them, Baba says that there are five basic human values and we make a list of all the sub-values or the manifestation of these values, of the, of the principal ones. He says there's truth, there's love, there's peace, there's righteousness, there's non-violence. These values, Baba says, are universal. Now, boys, let us prove the truth or falsity or falsehood of what Baba says. And then we begin to look at their society. Does anybody want falsehood in your villages? Does anyone like to be told lies? Lies? Who wants lies? Everybody wants the truth. You have local courts, don't you? The chief's courts. What are these courts about? They are about the establishment of truth to arrive at justice, isn't it? Justice and truth are synonymous. What about love? Everybody wants to be loved. There is love in the villages, or at least attempts have been made at love. Nobody wants hatred. People want to be cared for. People want forgiveness. People want compassion. People want kindness. People want charity, benevolence. And all these things, we bring them out from their societies. We let them identify what Swami is saying. Swami is not talking about things that are outside the domain of their societies. He is talking about things that are in the society, in every society, whatever name we might call that society. Right conduct. Is there anyone who likes bad behavior? No, sir. Mommy likes good behavior. Daddy, good behavior. Elders, good behavior. What about yourself? Do you want somebody to behave badly towards you? No, sir. Peace. Everybody talks about peace. Boys, have you heard about peace? Yes, peace initiative in Rwanda. Delegations going there to establish peace, to stop the warring tribes, to bring them to the table, drop your guns, shake hands, embrace each other. You're all one. Now, this is what Baba is talking about. Peace within yourself. We want peace in our countries. Zambia boys will not prosper if there is no peace. If we don't love one another here, no, there cannot be prosperity. Nonviolence, what does Jesus say? Jesus said, Moses' time says what? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, said Jesus, if somebody slaps you on the right cheek, give that person the left cheek. Don't return it, blow for blow. And what about love itself? What does the Bible say about love? John 3, verse 16. This now, I bring the question of cultural adaptation. All what I've been saying has to do with what I term the necessity of adapting Swami's teachings to the culture of the people of any country. Not compromising the principles. 
You cannot compromise love or truth or peace or any of this, but one can adapt. How does one adapt? In this particular case, the culture, part of the culture of Zambia is Christianity. Religion is part of the culture of any nation. And so we relate, this is very important brothers and sisters, Swami's teachings to the culture, to the Christian culture using the Bible very extensively. Because all that Swami says is contained in the Bible. The values are in the Bible from the first page from Genesis to the book of Revelation. They talk about truth, about love, about peace, about righteousness, about nonviolence. The Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught his disciples our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgiveness is an aspect of love. All that Jesus is saying, be good, praying to God to help us trying to help everybody. Jesus never said to any of his followers, my father. He says, our father, all of us. John 3 verse 16 says what? God so loves the world, you see, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It is the love of God. In other words, God created the universe out of love. God sent Jesus Christ out of love, a manifestation of his love. There you have the basic human value of love being mentioned in John 3, verse 16. So we bring all this to the culture, to the understanding of the peoples, as well as their parents, who are very strong Christians. Now, what does Swami say? Any form of worship, Swami says, is essentially valid. So we have not really projected Swami, if you think that because it is called Satya Sai School, so therefore we try to project Bhagwan Baba. We don't do that. We project, we solidify Christianity. Because this is what the children understand. But by so doing, they come to understand Bhagwan Baba. Side by side, Paripasu, as we talk about Christianity, we bring Swami's teachings. And the children, the teachers, see the parallel. See? They see beauty in what Bhagwan is saying in what Bhagwan is doing. And therefore, they do not see him as a threat. And let me re-emphasize this particular point. They see Swami as one who has come to support Christianity. In fact, it's amazing how the president, who is a Christian fundamentalist, you know, he is a born again, he is against all other religions, he says it, and just before Mrs. Kanu Genevieve left for India, he visited the school. He went into the auditorium and sat, there was Swami's picture, large picture behind him, sitting, we have the altar there. And he made a wonderful speech. He thanked the school for what it is doing. The unifying influence of the school. And for the first time in Zambia, he prayed that all the faiths can and should coexist, live together. The songs are in the local vernacular, and the people love it. We, in other words, we lift the people's expectations. When you value what the people do, when you value their culture, they will, in return, value what you say to them. The basic tenets are not 
modified at all. Now, let us look at the book of Kings. The King James's version of the Bible. Again, the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness, which is good conduct, right conduct, for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Swami says, why fear while I'm here? For thou art with me. So I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. And thou anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And this is the prayer that the boys recite. They sing in the morning when doing Naga Sankirtan. Because we do Naga Sankirtan every morning, especially the examination candidates. You, you have a group of boys, a group of boys, about nine of them in front, reciting this. This is King David's prayer. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. They recite it, and the rest follow, singing. Every morning, Naga Sankirtan. We walk within their culture. And so it becomes very easy for them to accept, for them to respond, for them to reciprocate. If we try to work outside their culture, then conflict, there would be conflict created immediately. So the lesson to learn is this. One should work within the culture of the people of the country. Of course you might say there are several brands of culture, but there are basic ones. Each one has got his own culture, his own tradition, and in a country like America, really, people should keep to their own traditions. I mean, I was with the young people today and they were asking me the question, oh, sometimes we hesitate to be called, uh, when we're asked whether we are Hindus, what do we say? I say, say you are Hindus. Be proud of Hinduism. It is one of the oldest, in fact, the oldest religion. Anybody who understands the principles of Hinduism will have no objection to anything that Hinduism stands for, especially modern Hinduism. Hinduism minus the caste system. But that is a social problem, that one. Because nowhere does Krishna say that people should be suppressed. I remember it very clearly. I was always bothered by this caste system before I came in contact with, uh, with Swami. Until I read the Gita. And I saw what Krishna talked about. Krishna was talking about the division of labor. Really. And he did not say that a laborer, for example, should not rise up to the highest status if he or she can. Uh, but of course, uh, the human being later on subsequently superimposed his own ideas for his own selfish interest. So it's important for us to do that. And this is one of the reasons why the children have responded so well. They see that we have faith in Swami. They say these people talk about Swami only, Baba, Baba, Baba. Plant the seed of Baba in the minds of people. It will grow. Don't worry, don't be impatient. Sometimes we become impatient. We want everybody to accept Swami, Baba. But we must remember that Swami really wants everybody to be good through the channel that he or she has chosen. So by doing all this, by showing the children that we represent their parents, they respond. Of course we do follow the pattern 
of imparting education in human values program, the lesson plans are there. We follow those ones. We follow the integrated method. This is important. Every Wednesday, we do have sessions for teachers, SSCHV sessions. Every Wednesday afternoon, the whole school closes, SSCHV. The students have their own lessons. Because it is a private school, an independent private school, and this is the beauty of it, we are in control. As long as we follow what has been laid down by the Ministry of Education, the syllabus laid down, what we do within the school is our business as a private institution. And this is why having a school is such a, a powerful instrument in spreading Swami's Education in Human Values program. So the students have a thorough understanding of the values themselves because they must have the theoretical background because ignorance sometimes can breed disaster. They must understand the theoretical background of these values. They must understand what the values are. They must be able to define them, all the sub-values, and the situations in which a value can be violated. They must know all that. And above all, they must also practice. But the most effective way, as we found out, of really imparting these values is what all of us who are in this program call the integrated approach where we do not say, for example, this is the, the period, 45 minutes of, uh, of values, where every teacher takes part. Every teacher becomes part of the program. The maths teacher should be able to teach the values in mathematics. The music teacher should be able to teach the values in music. The values should be discovered, should emerge as you go along. You should be value orientated, value conscious all the time. So that when it is violated or when you think it is necessary for this point to be stressed, in the middle of a lesson you bring it up. Of course your conduct, your behavior, everything should be a reflection of the human values which Bhagavan Baba is teaching us. Because people do watch us, they do study us. Don't for a moment feel that it has been an easy task. It is not easy because we are being constantly watched to see whether we practice what we, what we preach in society. The students also observe us. Do we work hard? Do we come late because we say we are teachers? No, we are the first to be present. What is happening, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, the boys see a different breed of teachers in their school. They see a different kind of education, different kind of concern. They have never seen something like that where teachers dedicate their lives to their own welfare. As I said yesterday, teachers are regarded as shepherds. That's how we call them. They are shepherds. And at that school, we lift up the spirits of the young people. We don't call them boys. We call them gentlemen. This is the rule in our school, in the Satyasai school. We call the boys gentlemen. They are gentlemen. And we call the little ones ladies. They are ladies, the girls, they are ladies. Now when you teach children to begin to feel they are gentlemen and they are ladies, they will grow up to become gentlemen and to become ladies. What are the qualities of a gentleman? What are the qualities of a lady? We bring in Swami's qualities. Ladies and gentlemen think no evil. They see no evil, they recite. They hear no evil. They speak no evil. They feel no evil. And they do no evil. These are the qualities of a lady. These are the qualities, some of the qualities of a gentleman. And they recite this. They recite them over and over and they try to grow up. When the president visits the school, there was a very interesting incident. One officer 
a very senior officer from State House, came running to me. He said, you know what? I met three of the girls. When I said to them, hello, girls, and they said, we are not girls. We are ladies. <laughs> and the man was shocked. He was so surprised. And even the president made that remark about the new culture. That's how the president calls it. To call these little girls ladies, to make them feel important, especially in a country where women are not highly regarded, you see. So by doing all these things, in bringing in Swami's ideals, really, being unafraid to put them across, and this has been the secret of the success of Satyasa High School. So therefore, we say the secret of the success of Satyasa High School is in two parts. One, Bhagavan Baba, His grace. And two, the implementation of His ideals. Fearless, the fearless implementation, fearless and honest implementation of His ideals, what He stands for in the lives of the children. It is these two factors that have brought about the miracle school, Satyasa, the miracle school school, the healing school, they call it, the praying school. We pray a lot there. And so I think, Rick, if I may stop just in case, I think there may be one or two questions, perhaps, time permitting. I would not mind answering some questions um, if you think that is, that is in order. But if I am asked to say more about the, the success of the, st of the school, this is what I have to say to you um, this afternoon. Continue consolidating your faith in Bhagwan Baba. Don't be afraid. Don't, of course, you don't have to go up and down the streets of uh, America beating drums, Sathya Sai Baba, Sathya Sai Baba. But if you are ever asked, I tell you this, if I'm ever asked, I was telling the young ones today, if I go to State House, White House, you, you call it the White House here, <laughs> and, and the President, President Clinton asks me the question, who is Satya Sai Baba? I will never say to him, he's Chancellor. I will say he's God incarnate. If anybody asks me, uh, if you ask me, I'll give you an honest answer. So with these few words, I want to thank you once again for listening. Now I think the, the floor is open for questioning, if possible. Okay. Is it working now? Mm. Okay. Yeah, um, Sairam, I would like to ask, uh, just as a follow-up to this question that we've sort of been working with now, yeah. let's take an example of some boy who has been into trouble, who has been uh, not accepted in school, dropped out of school, been rejected. He comes to your school in that first day. What, what is the process that he goes through? When does he start to click into your system, Swami's system? First day, he, he is very reactionary. He is reactionary. He, he reacts against what you are trying to put across to him. Now, we, we have to, to come into this. Yeah. James, can you stay with me? I'm going to do this interactively if I can. To, to stay with us, in the Balvikas programs we have here, yeah. we're having some struggles with the children in keeping them uh, disciplined and, and doing their following with the program and so on. There is a certain rebellion. We see this in American schools and the homes as well. Okay, so keep going now. What, what are you? Yes, that rebellion is natural. But parents must not give up, or adults must not give up. They must exercise, remember the two wills of the chariot, courage and patience. Sometimes adults become impatient. They want quick results, they want quick response from the children. But they are human beings, they are thinking beings, and we have to move slowly with them. I think this is my answer, patience. We have to exercise patience. Okay, so now the boy comes into your school and he is rebelling, and then what does he do? Does he start being infused with the spirit of things, with the, the uh, peer group? Well, if he comes now, because the peer group has now been sipped in Psi ideals, so really it would be like a drop of water 
placed in a cup full of milk, you see, he would be absorbed by the peer group. But initially, when we opened in 1992, yes, this problem was very strong. And the only way we were able to overcome it was through our patients, really. We stuck to what we were doing, and later on, they yielded, especially if you do it with love. So would they uh, resist even sitting in class? Would they resist studying? What, what would make them do their homework in the early days when you were getting started? In the early days, it is our insistence that they have to do their homework. And what was your leverage in that insistence besides just telling them that you... Well, make sure that if they don't do the homework that they stay at school and do it. So, so they couldn't go home. One has to be firm. <laughs> Firmness, discipline from day one, they must realize that they have come to a place where discipline is of paramount importance, that they have to obey. They will give in. <laughs> Sometimes we get scared. You see? They will give in in the end. And what relationship did you establish with their parents in that early days? Were they parents uh, supportive, not supportive? What were they? Yes, the parents are very supportive. They will support. Because the parents will understand that you are trying to, the parents know about their difficult children. <laughs> they have problems at home. <laughs> you know? <laughs> they know. And, you know, they look for schools or for people who are tough with their children, not tough in a harsh way, but who are rather firm, perhaps I should use the word firm. You know, parents want to see teachers who are firm. Sometimes they have no control over their children. No, we're bringing the parents. The parents, you must seek the cooperation of the parents. Yeah. So a student doesn't do his homework, and instead of letting them go home, you have them sit down they and got start to stay. working. They've got to do it. It is to be presented today. That's today. <laughs> today. And they have to stay. Yeah. And the parents will support you on this? Yes, right? they will support. They will support if you explain. You must have uh, very good uh, home links with parents. This is one of the things we do. There are excellent home links where teachers and parents have a very good rapport. Parent-teacher meetings, frequent ones, reports and visits where possible. Of course, like here, maybe it's too, it's difficult, the country is too big and the cities are too big. But where it is possible for you to be in contact with the parents over the telephone, explaining kindly, gently the problems and why you think this boy or this girl should stay at school or should not be given the pocket money, etc., whatever it is. But you must establish these links with parents. Yeah. And that's early in the game. Uh, early, very early from day one, you must do that. Yeah. Now, what about the problems of, say, skipping school or drugs or those kinds of things? Did you ever encounter those in the early days? Yes, skipping school, that one is very, very much so, but not drugs. We don't have a drug problem okay. among, uh, among students. But sk skipping school, yes, if you skip school, we contact your parents. Sometimes parents don't know sometimes what is happening. Uh, the boy or girl leaves home for school in the morning, and the parent assumes that he or she has gone to school. Now, a caring school should check, and if a boy or girl is absent, should immediately get in touch with the parents. I don't know whether it is possible here, but it is possible with us out there. And even here, I don't see why a parent would not like to know whether the child is at school or not. Yeah. Hmm? They do, yeah. So what about uh, in the classroom, disrespectful behavior, which I would expect you to have had, especially in the early days? Yeah. Well, they, they won't listen to the teacher, or they'll talk a lot, or because, I mean, we listen to them, and they're, they're, it's like they're in church when they're in the chemistry lab. Yes, yes, this is true. They do, they do talk a lot, but a lot of their talking is good. Um, they must be allowed to talk sometimes. Uh, only when the talking gets out of hand. In other words, we must not treat children as, uh, as stones, as brick stones, without feelings, you know, without emotions, etc., without uh, thinking faculty. They must be allowed to express themselves. In fact, that is a very good thing in education for children to express themselves in that way. 
But when it is getting out of hand, then of course the teacher steps in. That can be controlled. That so much depends on the personality of the teacher, the relationship between the teacher and the, and the students. You know? If that relationship is good, if the, te if the students have respect for the teachers, and that respect has to be worn by the teacher. Uh, the modern child does not want too much authority over it, really. They want you, really, to win their respect. If it is there, then all these problems will, will disappear. Now, your ratio between number of teachers to number of students, how do you balance that? Do you have a... The biggest class we have is 25 <coughs> per teacher. That is our biggest class because it's a private school. You see. So and will will uh, the children will go to different teachers? So how do you maintain that contact where the, someone is following the progress of the student and maintaining the connection with the parents? Well, what we do really the general pattern of teaching there is in the primary of school. Of course, is one teacher, one class, primary education. But high school, yes, the students go around. From, from the science lab, for example, to the geography class, to the history, to the maths class, etc. There, you must have a, an administrative structure which requires or which permits teachers to interact, where they can discuss common problems. In our school, we have what we call a management council made up of senior teachers. And the, it is the responsibility of this management council to deal with all disciplinary matters and to be in touch with the subject teachers. That relationship must be established, really, to have a good structure whereby there is constant interaction uh, between and among teachers on matters of discipline, not just on their subjects, really, but on matters pertaining to the welfare of the children at large. So you have somebody then that the teachers are communicating with and amongst themselves a set time where the teachers are getting there to discuss specific behavioral issues? They have to do that, yes. And that then, has to be done. And then who in that scenario then teaches or, or talks with the parents? Who? Who, who in, in that group of teachers and the overseer as far as discipline is concerned, who then communicates with the parents when there are issues to be brought home? Now, the, when, the, when the management council meets, really, the, management, the function of the management council is to advise the principal. It is the responsibility of every teacher, really, to be in touch with the parents. That's why we have open days. That's why we have days when all the parents come, to see the teachers in the presence of the student. And the teacher explains to the parent the problems facing the student, the merits and the merits, the strengths and weaknesses of the student in the presence of the student and the parent. That is being done on a monthly basis. It is an ongoing thing. Because if we say, for example, we remove that responsibility from teachers, uh, then you see you will have a bureaucracy setting in where you only have a small committee to deal with administrative or disciplinary problems. It is the duty of every teacher, really, to be, to be engaged in, in disciplinary matters and to establish good home links with, uh, with the children, with parents. Sir, I have a follow-up question. There is no corporal punishment at Satya Sai School whatsoever. Not even the principal administers corporal punishment. And this is another feature of the school in the country. Uh, authorities go there, they find no canes. <laughs> there is no cane. Love, does Swami hold a cane for us? It doesn't. Love. Uh, you may think, oh no, this is not possible, but it is possible. We don't cane any child at that school. No. No cane. Yes. Uh, is there television in Zambia, and how do you deal with the commercial culture, which is so prevalent in America? Well, there is television, but not as much as you, you, you have it in America. I understand that in America, some homes have television in the toilets and the... <laughs> <laughs> you know, yes, there is there is television, but not uh, 
but not, it does have effect on, uh, uh, on young people. That is true. It's like the TV is raising the children in this country. It, pro it provides the values. Yeah, but it is the parents, because the parents do not timetable. They just leave the TV. Of course, this problem is really getting into, in, into the country right now. Uh, for example, the parents love watching uh, dirty films, v uh, videos, and they leave them, you know, unattended. And we have cases when boys watch these, and we see them behaving differently. But it is the fault of parents. That's why Swami lays so much emphasis on the role of parents. Yes, please. Then they should not have had those children. They should have avoided having them. You know? This is the whole purpose. This is what Swam Today we behave, even animals behave better than we do in certain respects, Swami says. Uh, to the very sacred duty, the very sacred function of having a child is forgotten. It's forgotten among human beings. You, you, you know? Um, it is very sad, but it does happen, really. It is a sacred function to have a child. But do we look at it that way? It's just a casual affair, isn't it? Children are born. That's why Swami said, but then rats too have, have babies. So <laughs> once you have a, a, a human child, really, then you have a great responsibility to let that child become truly human in behavior. But that is not followed. So it is the responsibility of parents. Yes, please. The key to the success of a school is your trust and confidence on Can you say what is the secret of the trust and confidence? Oh. Yours. Yours and your wife. Interesting. The key to the success of us both yes. is, the, is your confidence and trust in Swam. Yes. Can you say what's the secret of the, your trust on Swam? The secret of my confidence in Swami is because I have had first hand personal experience of his divinity. I know without anybody telling me that he is God incarnate. That is the secret. My conscience tells me so, and I have had extraordinary experiences of his divinity. And therefore, I am left with no doubt that he is God. And so therefore, he being God, I must have confidence in him. I must trust him. Uh, pardon? Oh, I would be delighted, really. <laughs> yes. I would be delighted. The first one, and this is very important. I was an ambassador of my country in the United Kingdom with further accreditations to Norway and Sweden. That was a political appointment and like all political appointments they come and go. And when, it, when mine went, we remained in London. But I still lived like an ambassador. I became sipped in the English tradition of the pub. I drank all the wines, we drank, Genevieve and I drank all the wines of the world, the best wines in Europe. We never had a meal without a bottle of wine. Either it is red or white, depending on the kind of meat we had at table. All the cigarettes and cigars, high society, dining with the queen, going to the house of lords, I had a tail coach, you know, you know that coach. It's, it's got tails there with bow tie and a chain across here. Yeah. High society in London. So that went. 
I became fond of the pub. Every evening I would go to the pub and drink alcohol, great quantities. It was on one such occasion when I was very drunk, I went home, went to bed with all my shoes and my suits and everything. Then I had a wonderful dream. I told the young ones this, this dream this afternoon, a wonderful dream. I was floating in the air with two boys, young boys, very handsome. One on the left, one, the other, one on the right, and I was in the middle, and we were floating in the air. The sky was deep and blue. We did not speak to each other, but when we neared our destination, we began to descend like an aeroplane. Finally, we went through an arch, a narrow road in a village. On the left-hand side of this village was a walled compound. There was a high wall. And finally, these boys left me in the main gate of this compound. It was a wooden gate. And then they disappeared. There I met all the nations of the world. There was healing going on. And I met my ancestors, and they spoke to me in their language. And then I woke up. That was the turning point of my life. That was early 1975. For some unexplained reasons, I stopped going to the pub. I gave up alcohol, cigarette. I gave up high society. I could not explain why. I didn't know who Baba was until 1985 years later when I joined a group, when we went to Putpathy from Bangalore, I could recognize the terrain when we were descending. And when we reached Putapathy, I saw exactly that this was the place where these angels, I could only describe them as angels, had taken me to be cured. The Gopuram, that's where, the main gate, the big wooden gate, that was where they took me. That was my first encounter with Swami. In other words, he sent his angels to take me from my drunken stupor and make me a new person. Nobody, no psychiatrist, no doctor, nobody in the whole world could have changed me except God. I could not explain. This was the first encounter with Satya Sai. Isn't it a wonderful thing for someone just to give up drinking? And I didn't know why, but I just loathe alcohol. And since 1975, I have not touched a drop of alcohol or smoked. I didn't know him. I was enjoying myself in London. And he called me and cured me and changed me. It was five years later that I came to know of him. Second, I was president of the Spiritualist Association of Great Britain. This association deals with dead people's spirits. You know, we try to communicate with them. We get messages from them. It's a big organization in England. And I was president there for five years. And it was during that time that I came in contact with Swami. So I conducted a study circle one day. We were 21 in that study circle. And we discussed Baba's divinity, etc. Then I asked if we could invite a Buddhist monk. And the Buddhist monk did come the following Friday, the 14th of January, 1983. I asked him to speak about the Buddha, but he decided to speak about uh, Swami, whom he had met. But at the end of his talk, which was 45 minutes, I invited questions. The third question came from Valley, a dear friend of ours, an English lady with a very strong voice, and I quote her question. Who do you think Sai Baba is? Is he God? This was the question. And the Buddhist monk kept quiet for some time and then replied,
According, I'm quoting the Buddhist monk, according to the Buddhist philosophy, Satya Sai Baba is an advanced yogi, a great being. Stop, period. We were, all of us were devotees. We were disturbed by this reply, you know. In other words, here was the monk saying that, no, Baba is not God, you see. But he was only quoting his own philosophy of Buddhism. Baba is not God, he's just a yogi, an advanced one. He's a great man, he's a great being. This was on the 14th of January, 1983, Friday evening. Sunday morning, 3 o'clock, I woke up. After an extraordinary dream, I was on a hill. Satesai was in that hill also. It, there was a small house where he lived. Behind the house was a long row of elderly looking yogis, men. It was a long row of men. They were all dressed in long white robes with girdles round their waists. And I was dressed like them. They were all seated on the floor with their backs to the house where Baba was. And they were carrying out a yogic exercise. Everybody was a Oh, sorry. <laughs> because I, I wanted to demonstrate. They were carrying out a yogic exercise. What was it? With their right hand, each yogi was playing with his right toe. The idea being to get the right toe to rotate. That was a yogic exercise. I sat next to an elderly man and began to play with my toe, right toe. After three attempts, the toe rotated. You know, upwards, became like a small ball, like a tennis ball. So I jumped with great excitement. I've done it. I've, I was dancing in the dream. I've done it. I've done it. Like a child. You know, you've worked your own sums. You've got them right, and others were still struggling. You see? Then I heard a voice from the sky. The voice said, and I quote the words of the voice. Oh no, if you've only tried three times and you got your toe to rotate, it is not your power, it is the power of God. It took Yogananda 20 years to get his toe to rotate. That was the voice. Then I left these old men struggling to get their toes to rotate and walked towards the house where Swami was. Walked through the front door. The house was overlooking a beautiful valley. And when I looked up, I saw the whole, oh, the heavens were open. The whole sky was filled with writing. Big Gothic writing. It was like a book. The whole sky was filled. I stood there and exclaimed, Good Lord, I said. Then another voice from the sky, the left hand side said, Are you only seeing it now? It has always been there. I tried to read this wonderful writing, and then I woke up. But I could remember the last two verses. The last two verses said, I am he who was to come again. I am he who sent the paraclete. This was Sunday morning. The whole day I was in a daze because it, it, the scene was indescribable, what I saw. In the evening, I had forgotten the meaning of the word paraclete. I rushed for the Oxford English Dictionary, looked it up, paraclete. It says, Holy Ghost, Comforter, John chapter 14. I rushed for the Bible, opened 
the Bible, looked at John chapter 14, and there it was when Jesus' last days, when he was about to be killed. He was telling the disciples, a little while you shall see me, a little while you shall not see me. I go to the Father. My Father who has sent me will send you the paraclete, the Holy Ghost, to remind you of all the things that I have taught you. You may forget, but my Father will send the Holy Ghost to remind you of all the things that I have taught you so that you can put them in writing. I will come again, love one another as I have loved you. Jesus was talking to his disciples like this. And when I read the Bible, and having read what Swami said in the late 70s, that it was he, remember, it's in print, it was published in England, that it was he who sent Jesus Christ. This was a confirmation by the heavens that Baba is not a yogi. I am he who was to come again. Jesus Christ having merged with the Father, his return to earth will not be as a son, but as the Father himself. So the second coming is here. What the Christians have been expecting is already here. What a wonderful confirmation of Baba's divinity. I am he, he's saying, who was to come again? I am he who sent the paraclete. If you look at the Bible, the word paraclete is no longer there because paraclete is the Latin word. Paracleton is the Greek translation. Now, from paracleton to paraclete to Holy Ghost. The proper English translation now, not using the Latin Vulgate, that Bible, you will find Holy Ghost. Baba is saying, the heavens and say, I am he who was to come again. I am he who sent the Holy Ghost. I am the Father to whom Jesus Christ referred to. Wonderful revelation. So what else can I say about Baba? I think these two will do. There are many other instances, many other revelations about Swami. So if anybody asks me who Baba is, I can only say he is God because it is the truth. You see? Right. Yeah, but it's a wonderful thing and we are so privileged really to be, to be drawn by him. But Baba is truly God, Rick. I think I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you very, very much for listening. <laughs>